here. All right, guys, and I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen again. And then Brad, go ahead and get you introduced here, buddy. All right. All righty, guys. Well, um, thank you guys for uh, being patient there. Appreciate that. So again, really, really excited uh, tonight to have our very special guest with us, Mr. Brad Clark. Some of you had the opportunity to connect with him in the breakout rooms here a second ago, but uh, Brad is the managing partner at Prevail Innovative uh, Wealth Solutions, which is a phenomenal uh, wealth strategy team. And I really feel like they're disrupting the industry when it comes to educating uh, people about wealth preservation and strategy and such. So uh, really excited to learn more about that. Uh, previously, he previously founded, excuse me, Ask AgSpring, yep. a $800 million mission-driven agricultural platform, served as the interim president of a FinTech uh, SAAS platform, as well as the interim CEO of a startup with a proprietary protein-based nano carrier. Um, he's a thought leader in public-private partnerships, served as a VP and GM at Sprint, retired U.S. Navy fast attack submarine officer. That just sounds awesome, Brad, but thank you for your service. And then uh, he also earned his Juris Doctorate uh, degree, as well as his Bachelor's of Science in Business Administration and Marketing. So with that, Brad, welcome, man. Appreciate you being here. How are you, Brad? So it'd probably be a lot shorter if I just told people I couldn't hold a job, right? <laughs> <laughs> Spin it that way. Uh, so I, I appreciate you having me on here. So and gang, I, I this this is a pretty informal uh, uh, forum here. So um, I, I jump in, ask questions. Uh, no ownership on the time here. So I did uh, put some uh, a handful of slides together just to, as a crutch for me uh, to work with as we, we go through this stuff. So. Um, and really what I thought I'd share with you is a, a little bit different point of view, perhaps, uh, for as you, as you think about uh, putting your deals together and you get to the point you're, you're either an investor in a syndication or you're, you're a GP. I know Trevor's got his first one he's working on right now. Uh, he shared uh, what are investors looking for? And particularly if you're dealing with uh, professional advisors, how do they think about real estate? as an asset class and why would why would somebody why would somebody uh uh you know put this into their portfolio and so this is I'm, what i'm going to try to do is share a little bit of perspective and some you know some uh statistics and whatnot about uh the context uh for what everybody does for a living here okay um so with that uh if you can let me share my screen i'll be happy to to show you some uh slides here you're good to go brad go ahead buddy okay And I'll pull this up to, uh, I'd have been thinking I would have had this up front. Here we go. There, can everybody see that? Got Perfect. it? Okay. Perfect. So uh, Prevail is a, uh, it's a registered investment advisor and we've got a sleeve. We do some fixed income products. Uh, we think about uh, tax rate risk. And so some of the stuff that Cody was sharing with you there, we think we think a little bit differently with other registered investment advisor, very, very serious about uh, thinking about things that a lot, of, a lot of other money guys that advise high net worth individuals, they just, they just don't think about it. And so it, it's, it's in the press these days. And so, uh, you know, you can do your little hand thing and uh, show me, you know, how many of you would believe that the tax rates are going to go up and, you know, by a vote, I guess probably I'm almost 100% on this call, people would say, yeah, tax rates look like they're going to go up at some level. Uh, so that's a bit of what Cody was suggesting when we talk about um, how we think a little bit differently at Prevail. The reason why I helped uh, the, the founder of Prevail, and the CEO, a good friend of mine, uh, we were in a CEO group together uh, when I sold that, that last ag platform. Uh, I'm a client, was a client of theirs. Uh, he asked me to write a book about my experience with Prevail, uh, and I, I did that. It's called Accidental Handcuffs. Um, and we also got to, to, to working and looking and saying, well, what's missing? What kind of exposure do all of these investors want they can't get? And they want exposure to alternative assets, things that are not in the public marketplaces, that are not correlated, that behave differently, and, prime, and they want something that's an asset base, and that's real estate. 
but they can't get it. They could, they could get a rental property uh, if they wanted to be uh, actively manage that. If they know a guy that knows a guy, they might be able to get into a syndication or they can invest in a REIT or some other kind of publicly traded instrument. And those are, those are decent, but it's not the same thing as a private investment in commercial real estate. So that's the reason why we started this division. So uh, what I want to walk you through is just a little bit more, and, I, and I'll, I'll blow through this pretty fast. We'll have lots of time for questions afterwards. But um, the reason why we're doing this, we think about real estate as an asset class. And when you think about asset classes, it's all about diversification. So what does diversification mean? And, uh, Manasir, you know, you're, you're a newly minted uh, graduate here. You could probably give this portion of the presentation, but um, high, uh, registered investment advisors, the guys that are money managers, they typically subscribe to something called modern portfolios theory. And so all that is, is it's a strategy to allocate your holdings to a targeting return that's consistent with your risk appetite. And there's lots of different pieces of software that you would uh, go through and do that, but uh, uh, I joke around about, uh, it's all about eggs and pie. So don't put all your eggs in one basket and everybody's got a pie chart. That's what it is. That's what, that's what modern portfolio is. And you have a little bit different kind of a risk re uh, return uh, on each of those. So, well, what does it mean to uh, diversify? Diversification means that you're investing in assets or asset classes that are not correlated. And what that happens then is that gains from some asset classes, they'll offset the losses in the other asset classes. And overall for the portfolio, it reduces the risk in the portfolio lower than the sum of the parts. That's what diversification does for you. Technically, that's what it does for you. And there's lots of software out there that you can do this, these kind of calculations that runs, runs you through what your risk appetite is and, 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 and uh, uh, what your return uh, expectations would like to be and what your risk profile would be, okay? So that's what diversification is. Asset classes, those are groups of investments that have similar characteristics that tend to be regulated the same kind of way. So those, those are kind of the three big building blocks of them. And the types of asset classes, they're either stocks or the other category. So stocks, large cap, mid cap, small cap. <laughs> My company, I realized I thought I was all that, man. I, was, I had this big old company and uh, there's such a thing as a nano cap. My company was a nano cap. It was, a, it was a complete insult to me when I realized that my company was a nano cap. Um, so those are just different sizes, international, two different flavors of international. The other types of uh, asset classes uh, you see there across the bottom in the light, uh, including real estate. So those are the 10 asset classes. So why is that important? Well, when we think about alternatives or something that's not in the marketplace, they behave very, very differently. And so that light blue item across the bottom there, those are examples of vaults. So an alternative asset class, you see a little bit further breakdown here, private equity, real estate, of course, commodities, uh, insurance products, derivatives. Uh, these, are, these are a little bit different type of, an, of, of a, uh, a sleeve for an investment. They tend to be less liquid, just like everybody knows on this call here, you're getting into real estate. This is not, you can't turn around and sell it tomorrow. Um, you can't get your cash out of it once you get it in it. Um, and importantly, it's got a very, very low correlation to equity markets. I'll go into that a little bit more detail in a second. And what that does is, is when you put assets in or uh, your part of your portfolio into alts, it diversifies, it, it lowers the overall risk in the portfolio. And it also, uh, it ends up historically, you know, we can demonstrate to you that if you allocate some of your portfolio to alternative assets, your overall return goes up. Your overall return will go up. That's what has happened historically. No guarantees in the future, but that's what the historical uh, uh, metric would suggest. And you can see on this chart here some other uh, other distinctives with it. You know whether they need more specialized resources. Did they get a higher return than than public equities? How are they? How much volatile are they? Real estate's pretty cool because it tends to be less volatile. Yeah, you're not going to make probably make as much money necessarily as you're you're swinging for the fence with a spac uh, per se. Um, but it does diversify and it does enhance your returns. So that's what alts do. And more specifically, uh, when you think about uh, alternatives or think about asset classes, how do, you, how, do you, how do you determine whether something's correlated or not? Well, correlation, it's a measure how closely two things move together. If they're perfectly correlated, they go up and down at the same time. If they're perfectly negative correlated, they move in opposite directions in exactly the same fashion. If they're non-correlated, one will go up and down and the other one will, will stay, stay static. And so they're expressed in, in ones and zeros. And so if you're perfectly correlated, 
it's it's going to move exactly in tandem. It's a one. If it's perfect, perfectly negative, it'll it'll go opposite. And if it doesn't move at all, it's a zero. So that's how you think about the correlation metrics. Real estate has less than a tenth of a point correlation to publicly traded equities. It is almost effectively not correlated to public equities. And what that means is, is that one of your individual assets that you guys invest in, it's not going to move in tandem with the stock market. Historically, it's it, it, the things that are causing that that asset that you've invested in, multifamily, you know, how many doors you got, it ain't going to move the same direction as the stock market. It's not correlated. And if you if you subscribe to modern portfolio theory, that's a big deal. You want things that are not correlated. So this is kind of an eye chart here. This is called an asset class returns quilt. And so those 10 asset classes I talked you through, all this is, it's a stack ranking by year. Years are left to right. You can see it starts in 2010, goes over to 2019. And these are the 10 asset classes. These are the returns for that asset class for each year. It's just stack rent. Real estate's in blue that you can see there. Real estate, and this is all based on uh, publicly traded information because you can't, you can't get uh, you know, market level across the United States information on real estate performance. You get some anecdotal information, but you can't have it definitive. So this is based on the Dow Jones um, uh, US Select Index for REITs is what this is for real estate. And that just got, that approximates the value of real estate, not the, uh, not the income producing potential for real estate. What you can see here is that real estate, generally it's performing in the top quartile in most years over the last, over the last 10 years. And that's continuing, uh, it's continuing uh, through 20 and it's, it's doing pretty well in 2021. So what's interesting about this is that uh, not only is it in the, in the top quartile on a risk adjusted basis, it's the top performer. On a risk adjusted basis, real estate as an asset class is the top performer of all those 10 asset classes over the, over the last 10 years. So it's a, it's, a, it's a big deal in terms of an asset class. So what happens when you put an alt like this in your portfolio? Now, there was a, there was a smart professor out there uh, and he came up with this thing called the 20% rule. And basically he was advocating, he's like, put at least 20% of your investments in alts in your portfolio. And over the last uh, 20 years or so, people have. And so you look at this bar chart, in 1996, alts uh, represented about 5% of people's portfolios, and that's grown to about 26% in people's portfolios today. But look at the return criteria or the return profile. The impact of putting alts in your portfolio, it outperforms the percentage of concentration. So in, if you had 5% in 1996, that contributed 10% of your return. In 2019, if you had 26% of your portfolio, and alts that likely would have delivered 40% of your return. So box is way above its weight and that's real estate, okay? So we, we uh, believe that alts are mission critical and you gotta get into them, but how do you get into them? So the other thing about uh, 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 real estate and specifically to get it so it's not correlated and get it out of REITs and into a direct investment, you're gonna be investing in private transactions, not public markets. And there's some friction with that. And you guys know this. And somebody was talking about, I forget who it was, talking about going up to Austin and he got back yesterday. So it was a day trip and, you know, price discovery, it's, 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 it's very, very hard to find uh, uh, price comps with it. Um, this little chart here on the side, it just compares public and private markets. And you could look at that and you say, well, that's, that's a bad deal. Uh, it's illiquid. It's unpredictable. You don't get any information. It's opaque. Uh, there's a lot of friction. It's fragmented. Um, those could all be bad things. But everybody on this call would probably agree with me and say, nah, if I do it right, that gives me a competitive advantage, right? And so if I do my job right, each of those things that are different about having a private investment, it makes, it turns it into an opportunity for me. So for example, um, the, it, we say it's illiquid, but the stuff that's in pri or public markets as well, the entire portfolio is not invested, which lowers returns. So in order to provide liquidity in a REIT, for example, they got to have some stuff in cash. And what that means is that that dilutes the uh, investment from, uh, re dilutes returns for an investor. And that's not the same thing with yours, you're a liquid, but it wouldn't, you're not holding back cash, uh, you got that invested in the property. So that's an advantage. Um, with private transactions, 
uh, Trevor was just giving an example about there. That's a skill. That's Trevor's skill. The reason why he's going to get a better price on this or better deal for his investors or for himself is because he knows what he's doing, right? Uh, and when you're putting money into a public marketplace, it's kind of enables faceless thing. Yes, it's true that you get a lot of transparency in a public market. However, uh, if you do, if you if you look at the operating memorandums and uh, the disclosure statements that I do uh, with them, there's a uh, there's a ton more transparency in disclosing fees and risks and whatnot than the person would get uh, investing in a public marketplace. Uh, and the other thing that I like to do with these private transactions, I literally I can put it put it on a map. Uh, so when we do an investment, actually this last one we did, we sent all of our investors a pile of dirt when we broke ground. We, we sent a guy up there to, with a shovel and a bucket, brought it back and put it in a tombstone, put it in a little vial, you know, you know silk screen the name on it and gave it all to our investors. I thought that was really cool. They literally can see their property. Can't do that with uh, publicly traded stocks. Um, friction, yeah, maybe. There's transaction costs embedded in public deals though. You just can't see it uh is easily this one i can tell you exactly it's a five percent development fee it's a five percent construction fee it's a one percent placement fee it's a one percent you know liquidation fee you can exactly see what those transaction costs are with a private private deal and finally yeah it is fragmented it's very very small but we believe there lies the opportunity and so uh trevor found a deal i keep picking on you trevor you're up you're up on my screen here but uh trevor found a deal he knew a guy and so trevor's got a deal and he's buying it at a pretty damn good cap rate too. Uh, nicely done, Trevor. Uh, and the reason he can do that is because he knew something the other guy didn't know. And you're not going to get that with a public traded uh, publicly traded stock. So those are some distinctives uh, with it. Uh, next point I make, you guys know this too. Real estate gives you a very very unique um, double whammy. You get yield, and you get cap you get capital appreciation, right? And tax affected with cost sega and other other bennies, you're, you're, you can juice your yield on a tax affected basis. Um, you know appreciation; those are the distinctives with that. Uh, but but you, you guys, you know this is stock and trade for all of you. Don't want to belabor it, but oftentimes when you invest in publicly traded instruments, you don't get both. You got pick. Uh, and so if you want to go buy some Bitcoin and you want to run it up, you know to uh, fifty thousand bucks a share, great. It ain't throwing off dividends, guys. Um, it's not throwing off dividends. And with publicly traded instruments, it's usually one or the other. And so that asset quilt that I showed you, most of those are there for capital appreciation rather than yield. You might get some that, that, that do that, but it's, 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 it's few and far between. So to kind of land it on this topic, and then we're going to talk about inflation real fast. This is the reason why we like private real estate, not public real estate, not, not REITs, private real estate. It's not correlated. Uh, it outperforms historically. It reduces the historic portfolio risk. It gives you both uh, income and appreciation. You get a tax sheet along with it with your K-1 every year if you do it right. And being a private deal, you get you get uh, unique opportunities with it. By the way, I'm blowing through this, Cody. I'm blowing through this pretty fast here. I'm just mindful of the time here. So I'm, I'm talking pretty fast, but I uh, have time for questions. Uh, happy to talk with you as long as you like. You're so, good, Brad. Take your time, bud. You're good. All right, all right man. So... Uh, what about inflation? And you guys know this. I'm trying to give you some stuff here that you may not uh, see otherwise. Uh, if you go to my my uh, Prevail website, you go to my LinkedIn, you'll see a couple of white papers on this stuff. You can you can download this the same content. Uh, this I'm pulling this information from a couple of white papers I wrote. So inflation, all that is, it's a measure of the increase of price and goods over a period of time. That's all it is. And the guys that do this for a living, uh, they they they're want to put stuff in and take stuff out. I don't want to you know, say it's a political exercise, but uh, they change over time. It has to, the composites of these things that we're going to talk about here. They, they, they do have different uh, uh, building blocks that are associated with them. Uh, but generally speaking, today, stuff that people are spending money on has, has gone back and we recovered from pre-pandemic levels. And uh, the personal savings levels are there as well. And both of those things, most of the experts would, would tell you that that's driving inflation. That's upward price pressure. Well, what's upward price pressure mean? Well, there's two ways that you can look at that. There's a the consumer price index and the producer price index. The consumer price index, that's just the weighted average of a bundle of stuff that all of us on this call will go out there and buy. That's all that is. And the producer price index, same thing if you're a, a business. And so the, the inputs 
uh, for people that are manufacturing things, for example, that's what the producer price index is. Both of those are peaking very, very high. And in fact, the CPI uh, is running right about five and a half percent. That's the highest it's been in almost 15 years. It's not a record high, but it's pretty darn close. So the current economy and inflation, yeah, we're in an inflationary period. So the big, you know, the million dollar question is how long is it going to stick? And, you know, my crystal ball is not any better than anybody else's. However, all of you that are in the real estate business, you ought to be aware of what happens with real estate when there's inflation. And is real estate a good hedge against inflation? So some key attributes. You guys know this. Property income, that's, you know, it's rent payments, basically. Generally speaking, inflation will put um, pressure, uh, upward pressure on rents. And uh, if all of you are invested in multifamily, you're in a very unique subsector because you have the capability of raising rents every 12 months, sometimes even shorter, which is pretty cool. If you're running a commercial property uh, and you're running a warehouse or whatnot, that's not a yearly rent. That, and so you've got more, you have more exposure against inflation if, in fact, you can't raise the rents. But if you can't raise the rents, real estate's a pretty effective hedge against uh, inflation. It's a good thing. Property value. So this is how you calculate property value. You guys know this net operating income divided by the cap rate gives you the property value. Uh, cap rates usually go up with interest rates and interest rates usually go up in inflationary periods. So that means the, the uh, prices for the, uh, uh, for the properties with inflation uh, because of interest rate, if it's highly leveraged, you, your prices are gonna drop. But because of inflation, and construction prices and whatnot, that would put downward pressure on cap rates, which would make them more profitable. So it's kind of a push. So property values go up, go down, depending on uh, the nature, uh, nature of the beast out there. Generally speaking though, property values historically across the board have been a good hedge against inflation. Okay, I'll come back to that more specifically here in a second. Interest rates, this is what happens with interest rates. Inflation devalues currency, which causes lenders to increase interest rates. And so uh, inflation, interest rates go up. You all know that. Higher interest rate lowers the net operating income if you got leverage on your property. But it can create some scarcity in the marketplace that would uh, counteract that. And it would drop the cap rates and make your price, uh, price point go up. Last point, market demand. Uh, generally speaking, uh, Inflationary periods, these kind of hard assets, and particularly alts, um, demand goes up for it, which uh, decreases the supply, which drives up prices. My personal belief, that's what I see happening right now. Um, it's uh, there's a scarcity of supply out there, and you're seeing some crazy, crazy prices for product in the marketplace. So, can real estate hedge against inflation? Potentially, yeah, it can. So, here's a uh, uh, increase uh, study here. 38 years. 38 year study. And they found that for industrial retail and apartment subsectors, their elasticity versus the CPI show that it's almost a complete inflationary hedge. It's a good thing. But the rental income by itself, it doesn't keep up with the CPI. So what that tells you is that the value of your properties are a good hedge against inflation, not necessarily the rental income unless you can raise your rental income at the rate of inflation, okay? Two other things to consider. Lease terms, I made that point before here. If you can increase the uh, rents to match inflation, it's a good hedge. And the second, uh, if you got a good interest rate on your mortgage here, that's a pretty good inflation hedge, but you know, you gotta, you gotta stay out of the, uh, uh, the mortgage market. So two things relative, and, and again, that's instinctive for most of us here, but relative to inflation specifically, those are a couple of things to consider. Okay, so that's it about inflation. Last little uh, section here. This is about us. This is why we're doing what we're doing. And I'll try not to make this a commercial, but uh, those in our breakout session heard me describe this. Uh, the reason why we're doing what we're doing is because all of our clients are looking for a direct to market real estate investment opportunity and they can't get it. They wanna get into the alts. They want the non-correlated assets. They want something that's not publicly traded. For all the reasons I just walked through uh, with you in this slide deck, that's the reason why we started this division. So all we're doing, very straightforward, I'm not a real estate guy, I'm a deal guy. So my job is to part, find and partner with uh, asset property managers like the people on the phone here um, 
and I, I'm just a fulcrum. I'm just a connection point. And we work with our, our uh, partners uh, with the transaction. We structure the deal in such a way that's compliant with uh, uh, securities laws, and we we help to uh, we help to bring a product to market and uh, build the cap stack for them. The way we think about this, our investment thesis is one of two things: it's either opportunistic or it's yield. And so, opportunistic, pretty simply, just get in and get out. Maybe hold it for a couple of years and you flip it. And there's some properties like that, or we want to hold it for a longer period of time, you know, more than two years with a nine to 11% yield. That's it, this is that straightforward. So on a, on a return profile, it's either opportunistic or yield, but we always have a plan B because it's never gonna work out the way you want it to. So if we're thinking it's gonna be opportunistic, our fallback would be, okay, well, we thought we we're gonna sell it in two years, but it's not, it's got a cash flow, and vice versa. If it's a yield play, all right, well, uh, we, we thought we we're gonna hang on to it, just milk it for cash, but uh, the market tells us to sell it, we'll sell it. So that's our, that's our investment thesis from a return hold period. From a subsector, our belief is that anchoring in a particular subsector is flawed. And the reason why is because some, they, they heat up and people start chasing it. And when they chase it, the cap rates drop and it gets too frothy and you can't, you can't get a good deal in it. And so we don't want to go out there and say, well, all we're going to do is industrial warehouse or all we're going to do is multifamily. Uh, so we're more flexible than that. And you can see some of the you know, return profiles here in 2020, the different sectors out there. You know, retail got destroyed. Uh, so did hotels. Is it a good opportunity to get into retail and hotels this year? And we're looking at those kind of transactions now. And yes, there are some good deals out there in retail and hotels uh, now. Uh, industrials, pretty pretty frothy. Uh, you guys know better than I do what's going on with uh, multifamily uh, these days. Um, you know, I'm, I'm seeing stuff, you know, almost nearing three in a cap rate. That's crazy, craziness out there. So that we're, we're more flexible with an investment thesis. Uh, and so uh, it anchors in, well, we're going to evolve with market cycles. Uh, but what we want to do is we want to part, <clears throat> we want to partner in a sector with somebody who's got a proven track record. And we want to be agile and take advantage of any kind of a market cycle. It's pretty straightforward. So that's what we're doing. Uh, the way that we think about it, we don't want to uh, layer fees on this. We don't put fees on it. We just get the cap stack along with our partners. So it's not diluted to the return profile. Uh, the reason these asset uh, managers, guys like yourself, want to do this because they need some help. And you know, so it's, you don't, don't want to partner with me on every transaction, but we need some help. Give me a call. Happy to talk with you about it. Um, and our investors like it because they get access to these uh, non-correlated alts. So that's it. Pretty straightforward. Uh, here's some uh, legal disclaimers here. You'd be disappointed if I didn't share those with you. Uh, but that's it. That's what I got. Brad, that was excellent, man. You, I know you went through that really quick, but a, a ton, a ton of information there to go back and unpack. And I would definitely encourage uh, the audience, if, if anybody has any questions, feel free to come on screen, drop in the chat box. We'll make sure those get addressed. And uh, I guess while people are maybe articulating some of those questions, I have some questions for you, Brad. Sure. Um, and, and particularly related to your position on the inflation that we're seeing in today's marketplace. And, you know, one point that I didn't hear you address, and I did be interested to hear your point of view is, you know, there's the conversation of is this inflationary period we're in? Is it transitory versus non? How much of it is reflation from, you know, last year's uh, downturn? What's your position on the state of that inflation versus is it going to be transitory or is it going to be, um, you know, long-term? So I'm sure you all appreciate this. If I had the answer to that question, I would not be, <laughs> would not be on this call right now. <laughs> that's a, that's a you know, multi-million dollar question, baby. Um, did you, did you tell me you had a crystal ball that you yeah, did? Yeah, crystal ball, yeah. <laughs> no, I, who knows with it. Um, I, I, wait, I'll tell you this. Here's my answer to it. Uh, and this is kind of a, a layman's answer to it. It actually came from my wife. And she and she looked at me, she goes, you know what, all this, you know, the prices you see in the supermarket and whatnot, she goes, they're not going to drop those prices. Uh, those prices are not going to come back down. And, you know, once they're able to, to sell it for a certain price point, they're not going to drop the price. Same thing with wages. You're not going to get away with dropping the wages. So if you have to hire and spend whatever you got to spend to uh, bring a new person, I don't believe that you're going to be able to drop those prices as well. So does that mean it's going to continue to increase, you know, four or five, you know, percent? Um, maybe not that, but uh, the the new reality is, and these price points we've experienced right now, I, I think they're here to stay. 
So uh, my personal belief is, is that I think it's going to have some kind of softening on that. It's not going to continue streaming up around, you know, uh, 500 bips. Um, but that's just a, that's just a guess. Uh, but I but I can tell you, you know, with a high degree of certainty, is those prices are not coming down. Uh, why why would anybody be incented to do that? Uh, for, for the, for, on the CPI and the, and the producer price index, prices for the real estate and what the cap rates are. That's a different answer. That's a different question. Different answer, probably, uh, with that. So, well, that, just, that that was kind of leading me kind of into another question to piggyback off that. You know, we're in this perfect storm of, you know, not only inflation, whether it be transitory or not. You have this combination of cap rate compression. You have debt that is incredibly cheap right now with low interest rates, uh, and to the same argument, you have those that would argue that. Um, you know, we can't, we can't continue, we can't raise rates because with the national debt being the way it is, the interest the government's paying on that, you know, if we raise rate, it would actually slow down our economic recovery. Um, so the next question I guess I would have for you is where do you see in the capital markets as far as interest rates go? What do you project as far as, or should we start expecting, you know, some type of increase in rates or... Do you think they're here to stay in this low interest rate environment? Oh, yeah. So you, you, you mixed a bunch of stuff in there, Cody, and you're right. Um, and so, you know, the, the, the measures that the Feders would, would take to try to influence that, they're, they're material. And the markets respond to that. Um, and again, I, same thing about the crystal ball, but uh, comment. The, but I, you do know that if inflation continues to, to stick in, in where it's at right now, we're in right now, you're, the, the lenders are going to have to increase the interest rates, even if the feds don't, mm -hmm. um, because they, 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 they got to keep up with that to be able to, to, to put a profit on the bottom line. So, com, you know, commercial availability of, of, of debt, I think it's going to be more expensive uh, with it. The bigger question that you, that you, uh, uh, you know, suggested in that, in that comment there, it's the debt and our tax, as tax structure. Uh, the uh, it's interesting. So if you if you take the the U.S. and, and say, well, it's a little small business, you take a bunch of zeros off the of trillions of dollars. So the United States is about a yeah, it's about a three and a half million dollar company. That's our revenue base. It's three and a half trillion uh, our tax base that comes in. Uh, but we're spending about if you're a little company, you got a three and a half billion dollar revenue company. You're spending about four point two million dollars a year. Your 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 expenses exceed your revenue by about seven hundred thousand dollars a year. That's the United States. You say, well, how, how could you do that? I said, well, you can't do that. <laughs> you can't. Uh, it's not sustainable. And so the consequence of that is like, well, that's the income statement. We're, make, we're, we're, we're generating, you know, 3.2, 3.3 million dollars worth of revenue, but we're spending 4.5. You're losing seven, eight hundred thousand dollars a year on your little business. Well, your balance sheet with all of the uh, de deferred liabilities and whatnot, you're sitting about 90 million dollars worth of debt on a three and a half million dollar company. It's not sustainable. There's no way this is going to, there's no other way it's going to stick. The only thing that's going to happen is they're going to have to increase taxes. And even with that, it's still not going to work. So the United States is technically bankrupt. It was my business. There's no way I could get any more money from a bank. There's no way anybody's going to loan me money. And so uh, uh, our interest rate is going to go up. And you think about it in that kind of a context, bigger macro context, uh, you know, we're going to, you know, we, when we decoupled the, uh, the, you know, the dollar from the gold standard, that was a kind of the slippery slope with it. But, uh, yeah, it's a it's a mess. I'm very concerned about that. Which, if you believe there's going to be inflation, go buy more real estate, right? Absolutely, absolutely. Well, do you think? Um, and and now I'm just getting interested to in your own personal thesis here. But um, do you feel like we're going to continue to see more quantitative easing then? Because I mean, now with the government really just being able to push the print button anytime they want, uh, it kind of begs the argument that you could potentially ride this out for a lot longer if you can just continue printing money right i mean so yeah. it's it's it won't break you talk to some some economists out there you're, you're pretty close to the break point with this in terms of the national debt you, you said it one of your questions there is that how much how much can you afford to spend to service the debt relative to your tax base your revenue base and uh with with we're spending way too much money and you know we, we, we had all the COVID relief stuff and there's more that's pending right now with that can't afford it it's, 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 you don't have anything to pay for it. And so you just add it to the national debt. Well, you can't service the national debt. And you go, okay, now what? And you're really, really, really close to that inflection point. Uh, 
uh, and particularly with the stuff you know getting pushed through Congress right now. It's very, very close to the tipping point of, of, of that math just, it, it won't work. There's no, the, the people that hold our debt, uh, other countries hold our debt, you know, they expect to be paid uh, for it. So something's going to happen. I, I, I don't know what's going to happen, but uh, we're very close to a tipping point, I, I think. Sure, sure. Well, I appreciate those insights, man. I appreciate you sharing, uh, you know, your, your opinion on that. So the insight much- is very, very generous. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's an insight <laughs> Uh, well, and speaking of that, I want to kind of take it back full circle. You know, you are, you're a real estate division over at Prevail. Like you said, you're partnering with experienced operators to bring some of the equity stat. Um, and, you know, you're, you're exposing your clients to these alternative asset classes like real estate, uh, which again, I absolutely love. What, what are you guys hoping to see, not only just from an experience operator uh but like when you're talking about these topics how are they hedging against future downside risk what do you guys want to see when you're evaluating the opportunities that are hitting your desk um as that hedge if that makes sense sure yeah so we're looking we're looking for um uh men and women that you know have a track record uh and a number of years of in the business uh that have probably made a round trip at least you know once twice several times uh, and uh, some some level of assets under management, and this, none of these things are definitive. But you know, these are the types of things we look for. Uh, we 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 have to have somebody we feel comfortable working with, that we trust, and so that's kind of a personal thing. And so as we talk with them, we get to know know partners. Uh, we work with twenty or thirty different firms right now. Um, so it's some some intangible things with that. Uh, no bankruptcies, no you know lawsuits, you know just kind of kind of a clean track record. They know what they're doing. They've been there. They've been working it and do it. Uh, so that's the entity. Then on a transaction, uh, we stress test them out. And I, I could tell you, gang, I look at some of these performers right now. They all look the same. And so I was like, all right, we're going to buy it at a seven cap or a six cap, whatever we're going to buy it for. We're going to sell it for the same kind of cap rate. We're not going to take any kind of cap rate compression on it. And they're going to say we're going to increase the, the the rent on this thing, you know, two to three percent a year for the next, you know, five years. We're going to do interest only for the first three years. We're going to give you a cash on cash return of seven or eight percent, and we're going to sell it in five or seven years. And they're going to give you a seventeen percent IRR. Every single one of them looks the same way, uh, and it doesn't matter what market they're in. And they'll they'll talk about here's the absorption rate and here's a competitive set. And you know we manage you know properties better than the other guy, and I'm going to be able to get away with it. I'll put a little bit of capex into it, and we're going to you know pretty up the uh, uh, the common area maintenance and we're going to manage the property better they all look the same uh, so our job is to try to tease that apart and say okay well what happens if you can't increase rents three percent a year what happens then well what happens if you you're off on your capex you got to put into it what happens if you when you you recap out your interest only and you go to a you know a permanent you know facility what happens if interest rates go up two percent uh, and so my job is to uh, to push on the assumptions in your pro forma, because I, I mean I get it. You know everybody does the same thing. It's like you know here's your here's your stated return. This is what we think we could do. Uh, and uh, you know my job is to uh, to challenge those assumptions. So that's that's what we look for. I mean our investors, some of them like the flips. They want to get in and get out. They don't care about the cash flow. They just want to get in and get out and, and, and make a big score. Some of them say I don't want to ever sell it. If you can give me 8%, do a cost seg study, I get a K1 with a tax write-off on, on my, my passive income. I, I want more of those. I don't ever sell it. And, and everything in between. Some guys like you know, Houston, some guys wouldn't go to Texas to save their life. They only would invest in the Eastern Corridor. Some guys like multifamily, some guys like in industrial office. They're all over the board, all over the board. Uh, and that's good. That's good because that gives uh gives some uh, flexibility in the, in the types of transactions that we we look at and we partner with people. Sure, uh, Brad, would you be able to disclose since the inception of your real estate division how much capital have you guys been able to place in some of the offerings that you've come across? This yeah, year? I, I can't can't quite go in, in, into that, but I can tell you that they're typically uh, a raise would be uh, in the you know total project value is somewhere between probably somewhere 10 to 30 million bucks is the the total value and the leverage on that's you know usually somewhere but you know 60 60 to 7 percent levered on it and so you know the cap raises you know you, you make up the balance with that uh they're all a little bit different uh 
Uh, some of them have uh, less leverage on them than that. Some of them are, are you know, builds uh, versus, uh, you know, existing property. Uh, so greenfield kinds of stuff, uh, either spec builds or build to suit. Um, so they're, they're really kind of all over the board, but generally speaking, that's kind of the size. Uh, what I'm working on right now is about a, uh, what is it? Uh, it's 56 million uh, is the one I'm working on right now. Uh, so we'll see, it's kind of, that's, that's generally it. There, there's probably a too small uh, with it uh, to invoke the machine, uh, but it, it, you know, you know, that, that'd be kind of a more of a special type of a deal, something that's, you know, a million, $2 million transaction, something like that, be, that'd pretty, be pretty low end. Sure, sure. Does anybody else have any questions for Brad over here? I do. Have... Hey, Brad. Uh, hey, so the optimistic approach that you were going over with the 24 month sale of the property, uh -huh. um, apologize my ignorance. I'm pretty new to all of this. If you hold, I know when you hold like, you know, just a single family residence, if you hold it for two years or more, there's short term gains. But if you sell, 24 month mark, you're paying long-term capital gains. Is that correct? Uh, I, I, I don't think it's 24 months. I mean, somebody else is smarter than I am on that kinds of stuff. I, uh, but, but yeah, you, there's, a, there's a whole period to get long-term capital gains. You're right about that. I, I don't, I thought it was 12, but it might be 24. Okay. It's 12. 12. Yeah. But you're right. Otherwise you get taxed at the current income tax rate. If you hold it, if you hold it for less than 12. You're, you're exactly right, Brian. Awesome. Anybody else? I was just going to ask, is Brad's information in the chat? Uh, <laughs> no, but I, no, but I can, put it, I can put it there. Yeah, go ahead. And guys, don't worry. This recording is going to go out to all of those who were in attendance tonight. We'll make sure you guys get that along with... Um, uh, Brad's contact information and Brad, if you wouldn't mind, uh, would you uh, tell us how, you know, how we can get plugged into some of the great educational content that you guys are putting out over at Prevail? I know, like you said, you have some white papers. I believe you guys do some webinars and other things like that, right? Yeah, yeah, it's on the website. So I just, I just that loaded up there. The, the website's the same as the uh, uh, the URL on my on my uh, uh, email address there, prevailiws.com. Uh, so the the white papers and the uh, uh, the other kinds of stuff is is there on our website. It's also uh, it's on my my LinkedIn profile. You can find it. It's posted up there too. It's on it's on the company pro, uh, LinkedIn profile as well. Awesome, awesome. Any anybody else have any questions for Brad? I did have one uh, last question. I would, had a, had a good conversation in the breakout room, but Brad, I I um, want to kind of get into uh, your your. Um, switch from the consulting and agricultural background, what kind of caused you to make that change into real estate? I know you said you were a deal guy. So how did, how do you, how did you make that change and kind of get over, if any, some limiting beliefs and getting started into this journey at Prevail? Um, you know, it's interesting, you know, Cody, I saw uh, on your, your uh, setup with the, the, uh, background for this organization, uh, the multifamily organization, and it had a had an ethos to it, right? And it talked about giving back and, and the importance of education, and whatnot. There were th three points that you had on there, and so uh, it's Manasir, right? The pronounce it right? right. So for me, it was it's very much an it's an ethical thing, and so I believe that we're each uh, fearfully and wonderfully made. I'm very very unique, and my job is to try to figure out what I'm supposed to do and stop trying to uh, force my way into things. And I further believe that uh, my job as a leader in organization is to help other people that I work with uh, figure out how they're uniquely gifted and what they're supposed to be doing. And that's what I saw the word gifting, uh, gifted in the uh, in your mission statement for the organization, Cody. Yeah, good about, uh, yeah. You know, and that, that resonated with me because I, I very, very much firm, firmly believe that. So my path throughout life has been trying to be obedient and listen to the things that are being put in front of me and not presuppose anything, uh, but, to, uh, but to take it and kind of roll with it and to, to figure out, all right, well, how can I serve? And so I didn't think I was gonna be doing this. Um, I didn't think I was gonna get in agriculture. I didn't think I was gonna drive submarines. I mean, I just, you know, all this stuff, but there's, everything happened for a reason. Uh, and, uh, so I didn't, I didn't presuppose and say, you know, come, come heck or high water. All I'm going to do is this. I, I didn't do that. 
uh, I was trying to listen uh, to what's happening out there. So consequently, it's kind of it's it's been a very very interesting life. Uh, I've done a lot of very uh, very very different crazy kind of things, and but I can tell you they're all the same. This this real estate stuff has got a different face on it, but it's the same thing as buying a company, which is the same thing as running a company, which is the same thing as practicing law, which is the same thing as uh, you know serving in the military. There's there are different building blocks, but it's all the same. It's all the same stuff. Uh, and the more experiences that you collect, uh, my belief, the more experience you collect in life, the more you can see patterns in an application of, of your experiences. I will say that's that definitely uh, understood, uh, resonated with that with that verse as well. I like, I like the uh, you just just knowing that there's steps in the plan that have already been laid out before you, and that, that verse stands out to me too. So I definitely uh, appreciate you coming on, and, I, and for me. The, the root of the question just comes from a wanting to meld a passion as well as a skill set. So I, I think my, my last question would be um, just, I, I know that um, a lot of consulting background that you have, and again, going to, you know, just being open, not wanting to pigeonhole yourself. Where, where did you um, uh, find a, get past the, some of the constraints in scalability? Uh, and, and did you see any of that early in your career with Prevail? And how did you prevail? Um, <laughs> yeah, so that's a loaded question, man. Uh, good question. But it's uh, scale is is difficult. And, and the only thing I can tell you is that you, you get it one at a time. And uh, you can you can get a whole lot bigger if you go use, uh, I call it OPM. OPM is other people's money. Yep. And if you use other people's money, you can get bigger, faster. But when you take OPM, there's always strings attached. And depending on how much money you take and how risky the deal is, uh, the more you take and the more the more risk it is, there are going to be more strings attached. And the thing about other people's money is uh, at some point in time, they always want it back. So the, uh, and that's just kind of the nature of the beast. So yeah, you can get scale by using, there's different ways of leveraging it, but you know, the old fashioned way is, you know, I get one client at a time and then I get another client and I get another client. So you grow that way. Um, this, this ag platform you read about, that was a private equity back uh, venture. So we started out with zero, nothing, just two guys in a trash can. And we bought eight companies in about 18 months. And it was about a billion dollar company in literally less than two years. So uh, but that wasn't my money. I was spending somebody else's money uh, on it. But but you can get big really, really fast. But you got to know what you're doing. And so that was uh, an experience based. My partner was a, a former CEO in that sector. And I'm kind of a jack of He calls me a Swiss Army knife. He calls me a corporate Swiss Army knife. Uh, and so my job was the COO, I was the integrator on the firm. And so he was the, he was the expert, had a credibility in the market segment. Uh, and I was the uh, go-to guy to make stuff happen. Uh, and uh, that's that's the way that one came together. But we, we use other people's money. Thank you. Bet. Awesome, great stuff. Well, guys, for anybody that um, you know wants to learn more about Brad and his real estate division over Prevail, I highly encourage you guys to recommend as a personal client of Prevail and ha you know someone that has a relationship with you know Prevail for I don't know, Brad. I've been connected with you guys for uh, almost eighteen months now. Um, you know, really can just attest to the, and you keep coming back too, Cody. And, which and I keep coming back. I'm going through the whole executive chain there. <laughs> so, but I, I'll tell you, there's a reason why that is, is because, you know, obviously there's an alignment of interest here, both from a wealth strategy standpoint and preservation, but also just literally love what you guys are doing for the community and teaching people on how to become better stewards of their own financial independence and security and such. And so I highly recommend everybody connect with you guys over there. I was really excited that you guys launched this real estate division and, uh, you know, really glad that uh, you're here and, and looking forward to continue to work with you and, and, your clients and make some big things I, happen. So, hey Cody, can I give one teaser out there on that topic? Yes, sir. Please do. This is a whole another presentation, gang. And one of my colleagues is actually this is on the topic I wrote the book on. But this last deal we did, fully of one third of the investors in that, they borrowed the money to make the investment in the real estate deal. They borrowed the money from the cash value of their life insurance policy, and when they did that. They were continued. Uh, these are special types of life insurance policies. We, they don't they don't take it for the death benefit. They take it because it's a tax free way to accumulate cash. That's one of the strategies. So they're they're packing these insurance policies full of cash, 
they're what's called a non-direct recognition policy. And what that means is they can borrow the money out of the policy, but the policy continues to pay as if the money was still inside the policy. And those policies pay dividends. You got to pay interest on the borrowing of it. The interest is 4%, but the dividend is 6%. There's about a 200, and they're all a little bit different. So 1%, 2%, but you make 100 to 200 bips on the spread by taking the money out of your policy, putting it in the real estate. So when they were under, underwriting these transactions, so you're going to go, okay, well, I got a, a 9% cash on cash. And that's my yield on this real estate transaction. But because of the source of the capital, they were picking up another 1% to 2%. Uh, so, it, and, and Cody is a, is a client of the firm. And that's a whole nother presentation. Talk with you about how do you do that? But as a source of capital, uh, there's a way that you can do this. You can, uh, you can get some more uh, 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 leverage on transaction rather than just taking your cash out of a bank account. Colin, I don't know, are you an infinity banker guy? I saw you gave the thumbs up on it, but uh, there's a lot of uh, labels that you put on this type of a concept, but that's one of the strategies that we use from a tax planning standpoint. Brad, that's actually how I got connected with uh, Prevail is uh, through a good friend of yours, uh, Adam Dorn, and, and I learned this concept. And since then, I've got three policies for my three kids and, and leveraging uh, that exact strategy, man. It's, it's a great uh, tool. I'm sorry, I cut somebody off. Colin, was that you? No, I was just commenting because he called me out. <laughs> oh, you gave, a you gave a thumbs up, brother. Yeah, I did. Um, friend who does that and uh is oh, so i totally totally recommend it sorry guys we, i think we uh we got it muted but colin I'm, i think we may have missed that last part or i did at least you no know, i i don't know if you guys can hear me it might be my connection i was just saying that there's um, a lot of value in, you know, working with a team that can understand different um, investments and be because I, I did different planner or uh, Netflix and a lot of uh, great stock market, but they didn't know any about your purchase. Uh, and um, that's when I switched. And the difference in how to buy the hey Colin, I don't hear you at all, man. Hey Colin, sorry, yeah, man, you're breaking up really, really bad there, buddy. I think we lost you. Oh, and he just dropped off. <laughs> That's a bit of porn in our connection. There he is. So yeah, I you guys probably didn't hear anything I said, huh? No, unfortunately not, buddy. Sorry about that. I was on. I was off of Wi-Fi. I supposedly this is five G, but um, it's terrible here. Um, well, I was just saying that um, it, it makes a huge difference when you can work with somebody who understands all the investments, uh, not just one of them being stocks or life insurance. But if you can mix the the different investments and know how to uh, really uh, maximize or leverage. Uh, I really appreciate that what Brad said about the um, the policy and then being able to tap into the uh, uh, you know the, the 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 differences. So anyway, I I was properly advised at the time, fortunately, and it made a huge difference with my portfolio. Yeah, absolutely, awesome guys. Well, listen, Brad. Again, I want to thank you so much on behalf of the the audience here, the community. Thank you so much for spending such a great time with us and sharing a, a lot of great insights here. Again, I encourage everybody to please connect with Brad and his team over at Prevail. You won't be disappointed. A, a phenomenal group there. Uh, on behalf of Jarvis, Abel's, Nick, uh, myself, uh, we we appreciate everybody attending. We are going to go ahead and stick around for about another ten minutes, have another breakout session, and do a little bit more networking. So if you have to go. Uh, we hope to see you at one of our future events, but uh, if not, we'll see you in one of the breakout rooms. But thanks again, everybody. Brad, awesome job, man. Thank you. Yep. Awesome. Thank you. All right. So let me stop this recording here real quick, and then we'll get to those breakout rooms. There we go.